What's up, everybody? We're back. Corey used bloody history. So, let me see. I think I had some housekeeping items to go over first. Um, let me think. So, I have three hardcover signed copies of my book for sale. Uh, it will be at least a fucking month, if not more, before I have more copies available. Because Amazon likes to take for goddamn ever to print and send the books to me. Now, you can order a fucking book and they'll send it to you in like two days. But if I order like 10 or 20 books, uh, they make me wait a goddamn month. So, I have three hardcovers. They're 75 bucks shipped domestically. If you want them shipped internationally, it's going to be at least 100 bucks Because fucking international shipping is uh, crazy right now. So, but I'd like to sell those, um, and, uh, so hit me up, you can hit me up on, uh, email or telegram or whatever. Um, so let me think, I'm moving at the end of the month and, uh, once I get settled into my new place, let me think, it'll be the first or second week of April, I am looking to start writing again and I'm probably going to do the update to to a warning from history first I'm going to add three or four chapters to the book um, I haven't decided if I'm going to do any updates to the existing chapters but those, um, that I'm planning on having done by the end of the year. Uh, by the end of the year, could I get it done by November 22nd? Possibly. But by the end of the year, I'm planning on having uh, this updated version out. You see, the book was originally, my original vision had these additional chapters in it, but then the book would have been fucking like 550 pages and it would have taken another, you know, six months to fucking do. So I was like, fuck it. Let me put out what I have, which uh, is almost 400 pages as it is. And, um, so I envision a warning from history as having, uh, two updates. Basically there'll be a, uh, a second and a third edition. The third edition um, is going to have some more detailed stuff in it. Perhaps some history, unless I put the history stuff into the next book with Israel. But I got stuff on, like, you know, Anton Cermak and stuff on Huey Long. That needs to make it into a book, but I'm not really sure where to put it. Um, plus, I have the additional chapters on the. Texas School Book Depository and Jack Ruby and Dave Yaris and those guys and the Marion Meharg files, which is all super important. But yeah, so I'm planning on starting that as soon as I get settled into my new place and uh, having that done by the end of the year. And I figure then at the end of the year, starting next year, I will begin the second book in the series um, about Israel and whatnot. But today we're just going to continue on with the... <coughs> 8 plus 2 equals 10. Once again, the reference being that the Secret Service car pulled into Dealey Plaza. It had 10 men on it. Two men got off the car, Dave Powers and Clint Hill, leaving only 8 men on that vehicle. However, by the time they turned onto the Stemmons Freeway, they're back to having 10 men on the car. They picked up two passengers. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is the linchpin of the knoll so um what is today part five we'll be on this for like at least uh, through like part seven or eight maybe i can stretch this out to ten parts we'll see statement by jerry d kivett concerning the events of november 22nd 1963 november 29 1963 so what appears is that all of these secret service guys they gave a statement on the 22nd that night or that day, a pretty short, like, hey, this is what happened while it's still fresh in their memory. Then a couple days later, they were commanded to write another report, explain in detail 
everything. And that's been the pattern we've seen so far. And one thing that I want to point out is that every single person who was present in the Secret Service follow-up car, they all state that when Clint Hill runs to the limousine, he gets on the trunk, he instructs Jackie back into the car, and keeps her down below view. However, he never enters the car. Every single statement from every single Secret Service agent states that he stayed laying on the trunk. Yep, laid on the trunk the whole time. And so he could not have been the man standing in the back seat of the president's limousine as is depicted in the McIntyre number one photograph. Nope, nope, nope. So that is extremely important. Extremely important. All that stuff with Clinton Hill because he's a fucking lying traitor to his country. And he still tours the country and does these fucking events and all this stuff. He never mentions Jack Valenti. He never mentions... David Morales, he's a fucking lying scumbag traitor, just like every one of these Secret Service guys. Statement of Jerry D. Kivett. I was riding in the vice presidential follow-up car, immediately behind the president's car, and the third car behind the president's car. The vice president's car was a 1964 steel gray Lincoln convertible borrowed from Ford Motor Company, Dallas, Texas and was driven by Herschel Jacks, Texas Department of Public Safety. Asic Youngblood was riding in the right front seat of this vehicle. In the back seat uh, were Senator Yarborough, Mrs. Johnson, and the vice president, left to right. The vice president follow-up car was a 1963 yellow four-door Mercury sedan, also borrowed from Ford Motor Company, driven by Joe H. Rich, Texas Department of Public Safety. Cliff Carter, executive assistant to the vice president, was seated in the middle of the front seat and I was seated in the right front seat. In the rear seat was S.A. Taylor and Aitzak Johns, left to right respectively. The motorcade had just made a right turn from Main Street and then made an immediate left turn onto Elm Street. The motorcade was heading slightly downhill toward an underpass. As the motorcade was approximately one-third of the way to the underpass traveling between 10 and 15 miles per hour i heard a loud noise someone hollered what was that it sounded more like an extremely large firecracker in that it did not seem to have the sharp report of a rifle as i was looking in the direction of the noise which was to my right rear i heard another report then there was no doubt in my mind what was happening. I looked towards the vice presidential car, and as I did so, I could see the spectators, approximately 25 to 50, scattering. Some were falling to the ground, some were running up a small hill, and some were just standing there stunned. Here I heard the third shot. I could see the president's car and observed Mrs. Kennedy, who seemed to be standing up in the car. And trying to get out. I was getting out of the car to get to the vice president's car and assist Youngblood. I had reached for my gun but did not draw it. For I could not tell where the shots were coming from when I saw the presidential car speed down the street. Since I could not get to the vice presidential car, I fell back into the follow-up car and hollered to the driver to go, go. And the car lurched forward behind the vice president's car. During this time, I don't know exactly what happened, but it seems that the vice presidential follow-up car was moving quite slow. ASEC Johns was out of the car. I have no knowledge of what actions he took. And as we moved out, ASEC Johns was left. S.A. Taylor was seated to my left rear. Uh, and since all the actions took place on my right, I do not know what action he took. <clears throat> Cliff Carter, to the best of my knowledge, remained still in the middle front seat. Once we left the area, I could see all three cars. The president's car, I could not see any principal party and could not only see Clint Hill on the back of the car. Uh, I could only see Clint Hill on the back of the car. The follow-up car with some agent holding the AR-15 pointed in the air. The vice president's car, I could not see the vice president, but could see Asic Youngblood lying over the area where he had been sitting. I don't recall seeing Mrs. Johnson or Senator Yarborough. We were traveling at a high rate of speed, Aitzak Roberts said over the radio, and this is not a direct quote, but to the best of my recollection, to the hospital. 
to the hospital as fast as possible. Lawson, are we going to the hospital? Hurry, he's hit. Then Roberts called to Youngblood. I answered since Youngblood was using Baker frequency with our follow-up cars. However, I had a Charlie set in the follow-up car also. Robert said to cover our man. Good. I replied that Youngblood had him covered. At this point, Youngblood, who had switched his radio to Charlie, answered and stated that he had him covered and to take care of. Uh, we were right behind them. It took approximately four minutes from the time of the first shot was fired until we reached the hospital. As soon as we reached the hospital, ASIC Youngblood and myself ran the vice president into the hospital and continued running with him until we reached an isolated room. S.A. Taylor immediately followed with Mrs. Johnson. As we were taking the vice president into the hospital, Roberts informed him that the president had been shot and was critically injured and probably would die. Once inside the hospital, we had the vice president and Mrs. Johnson in an isolated room. We pulled all window shades as no one would know our exact location. At first, it was the vice president, Mrs. Johnson, Youngblood, and myself. Moments later, Emery Roberts came in and said the uh, president would not make it. A discussion followed as to what action would be taken, and all agents were in agreement that we should leave the hospital as soon as possible, fly to Washington, and go to the White House, which was the safest location for the vice president to go. The vice president asked for Congressman Homer Thornberry and Congressman Jack Brooks to join him in the isolated room. He also asked that someone go to get coffee for he and Mrs. Johnson. Uh, let's pull photographs of Homer Thornberry and Jack Brooks and compare them to the slim, suited man seen with Johnson in the, in the uh, isolated room at the hospital. Cliff Carter, who also had come into the room, went to get the coffee. Uh, Roy Kellerman came into the room and discussed the president's condition with the vice president. The vice president did not want to leave the hospital immediately and fly to the White House because he said it would appear presumptuous on his part. ASAC Youngblood told me to get in touch with, him, uh, with Austin, Texas, and Washington, D.C. and have agents assigned to the vice president's daughters immediately. I located a phone, which was being manned by a member of a telephone company who had accompanied the presidential party and who had an open line to the signal board in Washington. I asked first for Chief Rowley, then Chief Paterni, um, and ended up talking to Chief Wildy, W-I-L-D-Y. I told him to call Austin and have an agent assigned immediately to Linda Bird Johnson, and she could probably be located at uh, King Solving Dormitory, University of Texas. That an agent should also be assigned immediately to Lucy Baines Johnson, who could best be located at National Cathedral for Girls, Washington, D.C. Since I was uh, talking to the signal board, I asked for Austin, Texas. I talked to S.A. Payne, advised him to get an agent with Linda as soon as possible. He put S.A. Lockwood on the phone, and I told him to find Linda and stay with her until he heard further word, and that she was probably at King Solving Dormitory, University of Texas. Upon completing these calls, I went back to the room where the vice president was. Mrs. Johnson stated that she would like to visit Mrs. Kennedy and Mrs. Connolly, someone I don't remember who, I think it was a member of the hospital staff, showed Mrs. Johnson to Mrs. Kennedy's location and to Mrs. Connolly's location where she visited briefly with each. She was accompanied at all times by S.A. Taylor and myself. Upon returning to the isolated room where the vice president was located, I overheard Ken O'Donnell tell the vice president that the president was dead. It was then decided to leave the hospital immediately. ASAC Youngblood told me to get in touch with Air Force One to advise them to fuel for a cross-country flight and to move to another part of the airport. I located a phone which was open to the Dallas Signal Board and contacted Air Force One. Cannot recall who I talked to. I advised them to refuel the plane for a cross-country flight and to move it to another location. Oh, one more thing, if uh, guys, if you can pull the uh, transcripts of the conversations between Air Force One and anyone else that day. I was advised that the plane was refueled and ready to go and that they were in the process of trying to um, locate another location. <coughs> I told them to call me back as soon as they moved to a new location. I returned to the room where the vice president was and Youngblood told me we are leaving right now. 
We exited from the hospital by the same room we had entered. S.A. Taylor and myself accompanied Mrs. Johnson, placed her in an unmarked police sedan, and drove immediately behind the car carrying the vice president to the airport. A car of Secret Service agents followed directly behind us. This vehicle, the one Mrs. Johnson was in, was driven by a uniformed police officer, name unknown, with S.A. Taylor, S.A. Bennett, in the front seat. In the rear seat were Congressman Brooks, Mrs. Johnson, and myself left to right. I requested Mrs. Johnson to crouch down in the seat so that she could not be seen from the outside. She did so immediately. Upon arrival to the airport, Love Field, S.A. Taylor and myself ran Mrs. Johnson up the ramp into the airplane. Upon instructions from ASIC Youngblood, all window shades in the, airpl- in the airplane were pulled down, and checkpoints were established at both doors leading to the vice president's area of the airplane, Air Force One. At first, uh, the vice president was put in the stateroom, i.e. where the beds were. However, he said this was in bad taste, and he moved up to the sitting room where the table and television set are located. At first, inside the area where the vice president, uh, Mrs. Johnson, Cliff Carter, Marie Femmer, Jack Valente, members of the vice president's staff, Paul Glenn, vice president's Air Force valet, ASAC Youngblood, and myself S.A. Taylor manned the checkpoint at the front door leading to the stateroom, and S.A. Bennett manned the checkpoint at the rear door leading to the stateroom. There followed a series of conferences between the Vice President, Congressman Homer Thornberry, Congressman Jack Brooks, and Albert Thomas. The Vice President and the others in the stateroom uh, were also were also watching television accounts of the President's assassination. I do not recall what necessarily was discussed at one time or another. Various members of the White House staff came back to the stateroom to talk to the vice president. It was decided that the plane would remain and wait for Mrs. Kennedy and the president's body. Malcolm Kilduff asked me to inquire of the vice president if he wanted any press to go back on the plane with him. I inquired of the vice president uh, wishes in this matter, and he said, yes, let me talk to Kilduff. I then asked Kilduff to come in and talk to the vice president. About this time, we we received word that Mrs. Kennedy and the president's body were on the way. During the discussions that took place in the stateroom, the vice president stated that he had talked with the attorney general, and they agreed that the vice president should take the oath of office of President of the United States as soon as possible. The Vice President added that he had been able to contact Judge Sarah T. Hughes and she would be at the plane in 10 minutes to administer the oath of office. About this time, Mrs. Kennedy and the President's body arrived at the airplane. The Vice President and Mrs. Johnson attempted to console Mrs. Kennedy in the stateroom where she was. Uh, It was cleared of all personnel, exception of Vice President, Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Kennedy, Asic Youngblood, and a member or two of the White House staff, exactly who I cannot recall. <clears throat> Judge Hughes soon arrived and prepared to administer the oath of office. The vice president invited all who wished to observe the proceedings into the stateroom. I do not know exactly who was there, but to the best of my knowledge, the following persons were there. Vice President Mrs. Johnson, Mrs. Kennedy, Ken O'Donnell, Dave Powers, Congressman Brooks, Thomas, and Thornberry, Marie Femmer, Elizabeth Carpenter, Cliff Carter, Jack Valenti, Paul Glenn, ASAC Youngblood, ASAC Johns, uh, myself, Miriam Smith of the United States International, uh, United Press International, and Captain Staunton, Cecil Staunton, White House photographer, the vice president, took the oath of office at approximately 2.40 p.m. in the airplane, and it was airborne en route to Washington, D.C. at 2.47 p.m. The foregoing accounts of events is to the best of my knowledge, and that's from Jerry D. Kivett, special agent. Uh, Next, we have a statement from S.A. Warren Taylor, Vice Presidential Detail, statement regarding events in Dallas, Texas, on Friday, November 22nd, 1963. On Friday, November 22nd, 1963, I was working as a special agent with the Vice Presidential Detail, U.S. Secret Service, on a special assignment with Mrs. Johnson in Dallas, Texas, for the President's visit there. At 11.35 a.m., 
Central Time, I arrived at Love Field, Dallas, Texas, aboard Air Force Two with the Vice President and Mrs. Johnson. Vice President and Mrs. Johnson disembarked from the plane, and I remained in close proximity to Mrs. Johnson while she and the Vice President went over to a crowd awaiting the President's arrival behind a fence surrounding the field. Vice President and Mrs. Johnson were at the foot of the ramp upon which the President and Mrs. Kennedy disembarked from Air Force One at 11.38 a.m. Again, I was in close proximity to Mrs. Johnson. President and Mrs. Kennedy and Vice President and Mrs. Johnson all went back to the area of the general public <clears throat> and again shook hands for a short period of time. At 11.50 a.m. Central Time, the presidential and vice presidential motorcades departed Love Field, and at that time I was working the vice presidential follow-up car. The automobile in which I was riding was a late model Ford four-door sedan driven by an unknown man whom I was later told as an officer with the Texas Department of Public Safety. Special Agent Kivett was riding in the front and right seat, and Aitzak uh, Johns was in the right rear seat. Uh, Mr. Cliff Carter, a member of the Vice President's staff, was riding in the middle front seat, and I was in the rear left seat. On the way to the trade mart where the President was to speak, large crowds of people were along the side of the road, and as we entered the downtown area, I observed extremely large crowds along the street and in all the windows of large buildings in the, on the route. Our automobile had just turned a corner. The names of the streets are unknown to me. When I heard a bang which sounded like a possible firecracker, the sound coming from my right rear, out of the corner of my eye and off slightly to the right rear of our car, I noticed what now seems to me might have been a short piece of a uh, streamer flying in the air close to the ground, but due to the confusion of the moment, I thought that it was a firecracker. As a matter of course, I opened the door and prepared to get out of the car. In the instant that my left foot touched the ground, I heard uh, two more bangs and realized that they must be gunshots. Also, at that instant, the car paused slightly and I heard something over the radio to the effect that something or someone had been shot. At that moment, the car picked up speed and I pulled myself back into the car. During the aforementioned I also noticed that Aitzak Johns had completely jumped out of, the, out of our car, and as we sped away, I believe he was knocked to the ground and left in the street. I recall hearing S.A. Kivett telling the driver to go, go, and stay right behind the car. During all of the aforementioned, I could see Aitzak Youngblood in the vice president's car immediately in front of us jump to the back seat and cover the vice president. I was not looking at the president's car at the time and did not notice his car until we were well on our way to Parkland Hospital. When he did point my attention to the president's car, I could only notice uh, Hill White House detail laying across the trunk lid of the president's car. At no time subsequent to the first shot that I ever see the president uh, and what happened to him. Note, once again, we have another person saying that Clint Hill just laid on the trunk of the car. Hopped up on the back, laid on the trunk. Never stood in the back seat. In approximately three minutes from the time of the last shot, we arrived at Parkland Hospital, Dallas. When we arrived at the hospital, uh, I jumped out of the follow-up car, grabbed Mrs. Johnson from her car, and took her as quickly as possible into the hospital following the vice president. We went immediately to what I believe was a room in the emergency section of the hospital, a large room divided into sections by curtains hanging from the ceiling to the floor. Vice President and Mrs. Johnson, accompanied by ASIC Youngblood and S.A. Kivett, went immediately to one corner of the room, and I proceeded to... Uh, move a secretary and an unknown Negro male, whom I believe was a patient, out into the hall. I drew all the blinds and checked the entrances to the room, finding S.A. Glenn Bennett Protective Research Section, uh, who was temporarily assigned to the White House detail. S.A. Glenn Bennett Protective Research Section who was temporarily assigned to the White House detail. That is interesting. Why was Glenn Bennett of the protective research section? Now, I'm assuming protective research section is like what covers the front guys who would come out to the, uh, to the place a day or two before the event itself and scope it out. I would assume that would fall under that because that would be researching the area 
for the protective detail, right? So I'm assuming that what these guys do is to us on the outside would probably seem very similar, but to them is very specifically different. Uh, and this is probably a good example of that. So Glenn Bennett, who was at one point in time part of the protective research section, he was temporarily assigned to the White House detail. I want to know why that is. Uh, stationed at the doors in the above-mentioned room, I stood by inside the room awaiting instruction. During our short stay at the hospital, S.A. Kivett and myself accompanied Mrs. Johnson to and from a third-floor room where she spoke briefly to Mrs. John Connolly, wife of the governor of Texas. Also, during uh, the brief stay at the hospital, I was told by Aitzak Roberts, White House detail, to call the Dallas White House switchboard and have them notify uh, Air Force One to prepare for an immediate takeoff. I complied with this order, and approximately one half hour later, the Vice President and Mrs. Johnson uh, departed the hospital. S.A. Kivett and myself stayed with Mrs. Johnson and we left the hospital and we jumped into an unmarked police car, which happened to be standing by. Uh, the vice president, accompanied by ASAC Youngblood, jumped into another car and we proceeded to the Dallas airport and Air Force One, also riding in the car with Mrs. Johnson, S.A. Kivett and myself, were S.A. Glenn Bennett and Congressman Jack Brooks. An unknown police officer was driving the car. An escort of... Two motorcycles accompanied the above two vehicles to Love Field without incident. When we arrived at Love Field, we immediately boarded Air Force One, and I maintained a checkpoint in the forward compartment of the aircraft until the aircraft was airborne at approximately 2.50 p.m. Central Time. Between the time we boarded Air Force One and the time of takeoff, the vice president was sworn in as uh, president in his cabin. There were no unusual incidents during that time period. Warren W. Taylor, Special Agent 1-22. <clears throat> All right, so here we have a memorandum, U.S. Secret Service, to Chief Rowley. Dated November 29th from 8 ATSAC Stewart G. Stout, Jr., Section 1-16. I don't know what that is. 1-22 was the White House presidential detail. 1-16, I don't recall. Um, what does ATSAC mean? So SAIC is Special Agent in Charge. AT is either acting or assistant T and what does the T stand for? I don't recall offhand. Unless it's um, something temporary, special agent in charge, acting temporary special agent in charge, perhaps. I'm just taking a wild guess. Subject report of activities reporting to agent at Dallas, Texas, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, and once again that's Stuart Stout. The reporting agent and company with special agent of this section, Solomon Johnson, Olson, and Berger departed Fort Worth, Texas at 11.20 a.m. Friday, November 22, 1963, via U.S. Air Force plane number 6970 and arrived at Dallas Airport at 11.40 a.m. Upon arrival there, we were met at the plane ramp by S.A. Lawson, our advance agent who instructed us to take two Dallas police cars, which he pointed out to us, and proceed to the Dallas Trademart, uh, and there to report to S.A. Grant for post assignments. The police cars transported the above agents to the Trademart, where S.A. Grant did post the agents on their respective posts prior to the arrival of President Kennedy. The reporting agent affected security at a table directly in front of the President's position at the head table. At about 12.35 p.m., S.A. Grant came to the reporting agent's table and called me aside and informed me that something had happened to the president, that he understood the president had been hit with an object while going through an underpass. Uh, the reporting agent with S.A. Grant went to the White House telephone, where we met Dr. Berkeley, who was asking if we could find out where the president had been taken. Hang on a second. The reporting agent with S.A. Grant, went to the White House telephone where we met Dr. Berkeley. So, Berkeley was on the bus and arrived at the Trademart, where now, just past 1235, 
he's met by Stuart G. Stout, special agent, and it looks like special agent Grant. Remember, we're still looking for just one motherfucker to um, place Jack Valente at the trademark. He's not on the bus. We know that because of the statements of Marie Femmer, who put him on the bus in Fort Worth. But remember, he takes the plane, Air Force Two, to Love Field. So he's definitely not on the bus there. And she doesn't recall seeing him again. The last time she saw him that day was on the bus earlier that morning when he just popped on the bus to say hello. So... We're looking for anything to corroborate any of Jack Valenti's statements. Now, I say this tongue-in-cheek because I know we're never going to find it. Never. I mean, we got it from Betty fucking Forsling Harris, who's a lying CIA cunt, right? So we can't take her word for anything because how many, if you read my fucking book, Chapter 6, you'll see all the contradictions that I have in her statements, and Jack Valenti never mentions that bitch anyway, so... <sighs> Upon arrival at Parkland Hospital, essays Burger Solomon Johnson and Olson affected security at the doors in the main corridors leading into emergency room where the president was being treated. The reporting agent went inside the emergency room. After the death of the president, the reporting agent rode in the front seat of the ambulance carrying his body to the airport. Together with Asik Kellerman and S.A. Berger, who drove the ambulance, on arrival at the airport, I assisted in carrying the coffin from ambulance to the presidential aircraft. Air Force One departed Dallas, Texas, 2.50 p.m. and arrived at Andrews Air Force Base, Washington, D.C., 6 o'clock. And that's from Stuart Stout, approved by Special Agent Gerald Bain, B-E-H-N. On the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, November 22, 1963, Dallas, Texas, statement of Special Agent David B. Grant, United States Secret Service, concerning his activities and official duties on November 22, 1963. Statement dated December 1, 1963. Shortly before 9 a.m. on Friday, November 22, 1963, S.A. Lawson and I arrived at the Dallas Trademark. S.A. Lawson and I checked the final preparations for the president's visit. S.A. Lawson remained at the trademark for a short while and then departed for Love Field, Dallas, Texas, to set up security arrangements prior to the president's arrival. After S.A. Lawson departed and I discussed the luncheon arrangements with representatives of the trademark and assisted them with the seating of the president and the guests at the heated at the head table and any other problems that came up before the president arrived. With S.A.'s Stewart and Hallett, Dallas field office, I rechecked the police security both inside the trademark and outside at the parking lot area where the motorcade would arrive. At approximately 12 noon, I met with 8 Sack Stout, S.A.'s Johnson, Solomon, Olson, and Berger, who had arrived in Dallas prior to the president. And they were transported to the trademark by police car. I gave them a briefing on the arrangements and assigned uh, them to their respective posts. So, um, just if you'll recall, S.A. Johnson is the one who ends up taking possession of the pointed tip 303 bullet that would later be replaced with the quote-unquote magic bullet. A short time prior to the scheduled arrival of the president, I located Mr. Crow and Mr. Stemmons, co-owners of the trademark, and we went to the entrance where the president would arrive, and we discussed the procedure they should use when greeting the president and escorting him to the head table. While waiting at the entrance where the motorcade would arrive, at approximately 12.25 p.m., I called the White House switchboard and requested the board to contact the motorcade and have uh, them give me a five-minute signal before their arrival. This telephone was located just inside the entrance. Uh, I then continued my discussions with Mr. Crow and Mr. Stemmons outside the entrance where the president's car would stop. In a few minutes, the White House telephone rang, and I was told that the motorcade had given the five-minute signal. I went back outside with Mr. Crow and Mr. Stemmons to await the arrival. In a short while, I heard sirens approaching along the motorcade route. The motorcade went by the trademark at a great rate of speed, and I noticed that there was no one seated upright in the back seat of the presidential limousine, and that there was a person lying across the trunk of the car. Here we go, once again, 
another person who says that Clint Hale got up laid across the trunk of the car. Okay? He never stood up in the back seat of the car, as is depicted in McIntyre photo number one. After observing this, I immediately called the White House switchboard for information as to what happened. The operator on uh, the board informed me <clears throat> that he had no information other than he had heard on the base radio that the president had been hit and that the motorcade had been instructed to proceed to the nearest hospital. I then instructed the switchboard to find out what hospital the president had been taken to and the extent of his injury. At this time, I did not know that the president had been shot. I thought that someone had thrown a rock or a stick which had hit him. After receiving this information, I went into the trademark and informed 8 Sack Stout that something had happened to the president. 8 Sack Stout and I discussed the incident and decided that uh, we and the other agents should remain at the trademark in the event the injury to the president had not been serious and that he would, after treatment at the hospital, return to the trademark for the luncheon as scheduled. While awaiting further information, people arrived at the trademark who had been part of the motorcade. These individuals had been in cars that had been unable to keep up with the front part of the motorcade as it sped to the hospital. They indicated to me and to others that there had been some shooting and that the president had been wounded. Upon hearing this, all agents that were assigned uh, to the trademark building proceeded by police car to the Parkland Hospital and assumed posts in the area of the emergency room where the president had been taken. <clears throat> I remained on duty at the Parkland Hospital. While at the hospital, Aitzak Stout informed me of the death of the president. I remained at the hospital until the hearse carrying the body of the president with Mrs. Kennedy riding in the back departed the hospital for the airport. I rode in the front seat of a Lincoln convertible, which was used as a follow-up car directly behind the hearse from Parkland Hospital to Love Field, Dallas, Texas. I assisted in getting the coffin out of the hearse and carrying it aboard Air Force One. I remained at Love Field from that time until after Air Force One departed for Washington, D.C., after the departure of Air Force One, S.A. Lawson, Chief of Police Curry, and I proceeded to Dallas Police Headquarters. There had been a radio report <clears throat> of an individual that had been apprehended for the murder of a Dallas police officer. The thought was that the assassination of the president and the murder of the Dallas police officer could be related. Upon arriving at police headquarters, we located S.A.I.C. Sorrells, who was in conference with Captain Fritz. Homicide Supervisor, Dallas Police Department, from this time until approximately 4 a.m. the morning of November 23rd when I departed police headquarters with Inspector Kelly, who had arrived late that evening. I, along with SAIC Sorrells, S.A. Lawson, and other agents from the Dallas Field Office, assisted the Dallas Police and Captain Fritz with the homicide investigation. I returned to Dallas Police Headquarters at 8 a.m. this same morning with Inspector Kelly. I remained at police headquarters, providing what assistance I could until approximately 8.30 p.m., I departed Dallas, Texas aboard American Airlines flight number 628 at approximately 12 midnight carrying a blow-up of the photograph showing Oswald holding a rifle similar to the one used in the assassination which I was to deliver to our agents at the White House. Fucking, I'm not even going to get into it, but that's hilarious. I arrived in Washington, D.C. approximately 7 a.m. on the morning of November 24th, 1963 and delivered the photograph of the White House. That's a statement of David B. Grant, okay? But he just said here he was there all fucking day on the 23rd until 8.30 at night. I want his report. So if you guys can find his report <clears throat> from November 23rd of what the fuck he did all day long, that could be quite helpful. All right, here we have the uh, here we have a statement of David Grant. But check this out: statement of Special Agent David Grant, White House detail concerning advance arrangements made at Dallas, Texas, November nineteenth through twenty second, nineteen sixty three, for the visit of President Kennedy to Dallas, Texas, November twenty second, sixty three. Statement made on December first. Okay, how short is this one? Um, it's really fucking short. Okay, so he doesn't talk about what he did that day on the twenty third. Why? I arrived in Dallas, Texas aboard Delta Airlines flight number three, uh, number 821 at approximately 7.30 p.m. on the night of Monday, November 18th, 1963 from Palm Beach, Florida to assist S.A. Lawson in the arrangements for the president's visit. I was met upon my arrival by S.A. Lawson 
who transported me to my hotel. The next morning, Tuesday, November 19th, 1963, S.A. Lawson and I went to the Dallas field office where I met SAIC, special agent in charge, Sorrells, and the other field agent, uh, officer agents, uh, S.A. Lawson and SAIC Sorrells briefed me on the arrangements that had been made for the visit. After this briefing, we proceeded to the Dallas Trade Mart and met with representatives of the Trade Mart and Dallas Police Department. We discussed again uh, with these individuals the committee's program and the president's activity while he was attending the luncheon. We then surveyed the building extensively with senior Dallas Police Department officers locating security post assignments um, throughout the building. On Wednesday, November 20th, 1963, I accompanied... SAIC Sorrells and S.A. Lawson to Love Field, where the spotting of Air Force One was discussed, the forming of the motorcade, the route of the motorcade off the ramp, and general security arrangements were agreed upon. When we departed Love Field, we returned to the Dallas Trademark for more discussions with the representatives there. On Thursday, November 21st, 1963, SAIC Sorrells and I met S.A. Lawson at Mr. Sam Bloom's office in Dallas. Mr. Bloom was one of S.A. Lawson's contacts for the visit. Following the meeting there, uh, we proceeded to Love Field and finalized the security arrangements at the airport with Dallas police officers. After departing the airport, we returned to the Trade Mart again and had discussions with their representatives. SAIC Sorrells, S.A. Lawson, and I then went to the Continental Bus Company. Huh? Where S.A. Lawson briefed the supervisors on the requirements and duties of the buses and drivers in the motorcade. The Continental Bus Company. That shit keeps popping up. Uh, When we departed the bus company, we proceeded to police department headquarters where... Uh, Chief of Police Curry and his senior officers responsible for the various areas involved were gathered for a final meeting. At this meeting, the entire security arrangements uh, for the visits were discussed. S.A. Lawson went over to went over the entire visit from the time of the president's arrival at Love Field until his departure. Security at Love Field, the trademark, the motorcade, and identifications were the subject of discussion. Each senior police officer concerned with the visit was present and was provided with all information regarding the president's visit to pass down their commands. Uh, That's from David B. Grant. I got to this. uh, That's a name you never hear. You never hear the name of David B. Grant, special agent, White House detail. Uh, He was an advance man. Advance man show up a couple days in advance um, and check the place out and do all this stuff. And, you know. If anybody failed, he did just as much as anyone else. So, yeah, let's see if we can't find his statements to cover what he did on that day because there had to have been one, like a period, on the on, for the 23rd of November. To James Rowley, November 29, 63, uh, from Special Agent Sullivan, uh, Unit 116, White House Detail. Subject activities of this special agent in Dallas, Texas, on Friday, November 22nd, 1963. On Friday, November 22nd, 63, this special agent was a member of the 4 p.m. to 12 midnight shift under 8-sack Stout, which departed Fort Worth, Texas via USAF number 6970 at 11.20 a.m., arriving at Dallas, Texas, Love Field at 11.40 a.m. Upon deplaning, we were met by S.A. Lawson, the White House detail advance agent, who instructed us to depart for the Dallas Trademark in waiting unmarked Dallas police cars. Upon arriving at the Trademark, I reported to S.A. Grant, another White House detail advance agent, who assigned me to my post, which was the left front of the head table. When word came to 8 Sack Stout at the Trademark that the president had been shot, he asked us to return to our awaiting police cars and proceed to the Parkland Memorial Hospital. Arriving at the hospital... Uh, We helped set up security in the area around the emergency ward. Shortly after 2 p.m., S.A. Hill asked S.A.'s Grant, Olson, and myself to clear the hallway outside of the emergency room and do the same outside of the emergency entrance to the hospital so that the president's body could be taken out of the hospital and into the awaiting hearse. As the hearse left the hospital under police escort, I, along with other agents of the 4 to 12 midnight shift, jumped into a four-door Lincoln, which was in the motorcade, and followed the hearse to Love Field. I then helped remove the casket from the hearse and into uh, USAF number 26000 and 
US two, uh, USAF number 26000 departed Love Field at 2 p.m. That's Air Force One. Arriving at Washington Andrews Air Force Base at 6 p.m. That's from Samuel E. Sullivan, Special Agent. Memorandum, Chief James J. Rowley, November 30th, 1963, from S.A. Olson, 116, White House Detail. So the designations 1-16 and 1-22 are both White House Detail, so therefore I'm assuming the 16 or 22 part is going to be an indicator of shift. Subject, activities in Dallas, Texas, on November 22nd, 63. On Friday, November 22nd, 1963, while under the supervision of 8SAC Stuart G. Stout, I departed Fort Worth, Texas with via USAF 6970 at 11.20 a.m. and arrived at Love Field, Dallas, Texas, 11.40 a.m. Upon arrival, we were met by Special Agent Lawson, White House Detail Advance Agent, we were immediately transported to the Dallas Trademark via unmarked Dallas police cars. At the Trademark, we were met by Special Agent Grant, another White House detail advance agent, and I was placed on my security post at the right front of the head table at which the president was to be seated. When 8 Sack Stout received word that President Kennedy had been shot, we proceeded directly to Parkland Memorial via unmarked Dallas police cars. I assisted in security in the area of the emergency ward where the president was receiving treatment. At approximately 2 p.m., Special Agents Grant, Solomon, myself, and Dallas police personnel cleared uh, the corridor leading from the emergency room to the emergency entrance and the area outside the emergency entrance of the hospital. I then observed the president's casket being loaded into a hearse. I and then and other Secret Service agents then proceeded via automobile to follow the hearse containing the president's casket to Love Field, Dallas, Texas, where we loaded the casket aboard U.S. Air Force 26000 and departed Dallas, Texas via this same aircraft arriving at Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland at 6 p.m. That's from Ernest E. Olson, another name you never hear. <clears throat> another statement from... Agent John Joe Howlett, date November 22nd, 63. On November 22nd, 1963, I was assigned to assist in the security at Trademark 2100 Stemmons Freeway, Dallas, Texas, for the president's visit. At 7 a.m. on November 22nd, I met S.A. Robert A. Stewart at the uh, Secret Service Office, Dallas. S.A. Stewart and I proceeded to the Trademark. In uh, SS car number 361, I immediately took post at the entrance and briefed the trademark people on entrance identification. At about 8.30 a.m., I met with a representative of the Dallas Power and Light Company. We went uh, down to the tunnel under the entrance where President Kennedy was to enter. We completely inspected both tunnels and equipment, and one was locked and one was left unlocked. Dallas police officers at the tunnel entrances were instructed to let no one in the tunnels unless a Secret Service agent was present. I returned to my post of duty and checked on the entrance procedures in, uh, in, pro in the process. I then went to the head table and uh, assisted S.A. Robert A. Stewart by crawling under the head table and making an inspection for any dangerous objects and stability of the head table platform. <clears throat> I then returned to my post of duty to check on entrance procedures and uh, re uh, retained at this point except when uh, it was necessary to leave and remained at this point except when it was necessary to leave and talk with uh, S.A. Robert Stewart, S.A. Wynn Lawson, and S.A. Dave Grant, or one of the committee members. I was informed of the five-minute arrival time, and a few minutes later was advised, advised by S.A. Dave Grant that the president had been hit with something and to remain at my uh, post of duty. A short time later, it was confirmed that the president had been shot, and I was advised by one of the special agents of the White House detail to get S.A. Robert Stewart and proceed to Parkland Hospital. I located S.A. Robert Stewart in the vicinity of Head Table and informed him we were to proceed to Parkland Hospital. I then drove S.A. Stewart's car to Parkland Hospital with S.A. Stewart. I was advised upon arrival at Parkland Hospital to take security in the hallway leading to the emergency room. A few minutes later, I was advised by a special agent of the White House detail to assist them in making the president's car to Love Field. I then left my post and went to the president's car at the emergency entrance of Parkland Hospital. 
About five minutes later, we departed Parkland Hospital with the president's car. I was riding in the right front seat and the Secret Service follow-up car with a police motorcycle escort. We drove the cars into the vicinity of the uh, Continental Hangar at Love Field and secured the cars and kept the people at a distance of about 100 feet. The police motorcycle officer radioed the police at Love Field that we needed assistance to get the cars across the runways to where Air Force cargo plane was parked. About five minutes later, the Love Field police car had uh, arrived, uh, determined the parking area where the Air Force cargo plane was located. They then received clearance from the Love Field tower and they escorted us to the cargo plane. Several crew members of the cargo plane were present upon our arrival and they immediately hand cranked the cargo plane's doors open. The president's car was then placed in the aircraft. About 10 minutes later, I received a ride in the Love Field police car to the area where Air Force One was parked. I then set up my post at the left rear about 60 feet from Air Force One. I remained at this post until Air Force One departed Love Field. That's John Joe Howlett. He's got, they got this guy crawling on his hands and knees looking under tables, so he's probably a, a, a low-level guy at this point. Um, let me see. Chief James Rowley, November 30th, from S.A. Berger, 116 White House Detail. Activities of this special agent in Dallas, Texas, on Friday, November 22nd, 1963. On Friday, November 22nd, 1963, this special agent was a member of the 4 o'clock to midnight shift under 8th Sack Stout, which departed Fort Worth, Texas, via USAF number 6970 at 11.20 a.m., arriving at Dallas, Texas, Love Field at 11.40 a.m. Upon deplaning, we were met by S.A. Lawson, the White House detail advance agent who instructed us to depart for Dallas Trademark in waiting unmarked Dallas police cars. Upon arriving at the Trademark, I reported to S.A. Grant, another White House detail advance agent who assigned me my designated post, which was the press area in the second balcony. When I received word from a newspaper man that the president had been shot, I immediately went downstairs to tell 8 Sex Stout, who at this time was confirming the incident. At this time, I saw Dr. Berkeley and Chief Hendricks. and asked them to accompany me to park on hospital in a police car, which they did. Okay, so... <clears throat> let's, let's, we're trying to narrow down a timeline here, right? So, when I received word from a newspaper man, the president shot, I immediately went downstairs. So, he finds out about it, probably within a couple minutes of it happening. I'd say by this is by 12.35, I would have to say. And he goes downstairs, and Berkeley's there, which means the bus that contained all the secretaries and stuff made it there by about 12.35. Hmm. The remainder of the 4 to 12 shift then arrived with S.A. Johnson being posted with me. Soon after, Mr. Dave Powers asked where the priest was. With S.A. Johnson holding the post, the reporting agent went to the outside of the hospital where I saw two Catholic priests who I asked to accompany me to the emergency room. Shortly thereafter, FBI agent Vincent Drain, commission book number 5067 Dallas office, arrived at the room entrance. He showed me his credentials and said he had received a telephone call from Director Hoover telling him to make himself available to us. This information was conveyed to Asa Kellerman. When I inquired of Agent Drain, who the unidentified male was who accompanied him, he replied that he was a doctor friend of his. That's fucking weird. The agent and unidentified male then proceeded to the end of the hall approximately five minutes subsequent to the visit of Agent Drain, an unidentified CIA agent... After showing his credentials, said he would be available. What? 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 The agent and an unidentified male then proceeded to the end of the hall. Approximately five minutes subsequent to the visit of Agent Drain, an unidentified CIA agent, after showing his credentials, said he would be available. Really? So a CIA agent showed his credentials. What fucking CIA agent who would be a card-carrying CIA agent? What kind of CIA agent has a fucking ID card that says CIA? Only fucking high-level CIA employees. They don't give that shit to the Clay Shaws of the world or the Guy Bannisters. 
they do give that shit to the David Morales of the world. I wish he'd have given a fucking description, because from what I can tell, Dave Morales makes his way to Parkland Hospital somehow, or at least he's on the fucking Secret Service car and gets off at some point before Parkland Hospital. But what CIA agent could have possibly fucking shown credentials? What super high-level employee CIA agent would have had fucking credentials? At approximately 1.30 p.m., the chief supervising nurse, a Mrs. Nelson, stated to enter the emergency room with an unidentified male, white male, 45 years of age, 6'2", 185-190 pounds, gray hair. As the reporting agent and S.A. Johnson started to ask his identity, he shouted that he was FBI. Just as we began to ask for his credentials, he abruptly entered the emergency room and had to be forcibly restrained by us. Asic Kellerman then appeared and asked this individual to go to the end of the hall. Congressman Olin E. Teague, Texas, witnessed this incident and verbally stated to this agent, that if there are any inquiries in the future, he'd be more than glad to give a statement to the service in the service's behalf. Nurse Nelson was also interviewed by this agent in the presence of S.A. Johnson and Congressman Teague and stated that the unidentified FBI agent had not shown us any credentials nor any to her. At approximately 2 p.m., the president's body was taken from the hospital to an awaiting hearse. At this time, Asic Kellerman instructed me to drive the hearse, which I did, accompanied by Asic Kellerman, Asic Stout, S.A. Hill, and Mrs. Kennedy. Shortly thereafter, we arrived at Love Field under police escort. I then helped remove the casket from the hearse and into U.S. Air Force No. 26000. No. 26000 departed Love Field at 2.47 p.m., arriving in Washington, Andrews Air Force Base at 6 p.m. I then escorted President Johnson to the White House via helicopter No. 2. It's from Special Agent Andrew Berger. White House Detail 1-16. All right. Um, this is a statement from Robert Stewart, November 22nd, 1963. On November 22nd, 63, about 7 a.m., met Special Agent John Joe Howlett at the Dallas office. We proceeded together to the Trademark Building, 2100 Simmons Freeway, Dallas, Texas, to take up our posts of duty in connection with the President's visit to Dallas. We traveled in government-owned autos, SS361. My post of duty was the area of the building immediately back of the speaker's table and platform. It was assisted by S.A. Howlett in securing the platform itself. He crawled under entire platform with a flashlight and I held up a bunting sides of the platform to give him light to receive a few shreds of bunting that had been left there apparently by the decorating committee. My area to hold secure was a space about 80 foot by 40 foot in size. There was a small kidney-shaped pool back of the speaker's platform, just 8 foot by 25 foot in size. There was also a small gazebo, Japanese summer house, built adjoining the pool. During the morning, I was contacted from time to time by Special Agent David B. Grant, who was introduced to me by Special Agent Winston Lawson. Also, during the morning, I was joined by Captain J.W. Fritz and other officers under his command to assist in security at this post. I was informed of the five-minute arrival time of expected arrival. A few, min a few moments later, Special Agent Grant informed Special Agent Howlett and myself that he just learned the president had been hit with something, that we should remain at our duty post. A few minutes later, Special Agent Hallett rushed to me saying that he had instructions from a White House agent that both of us should proceed immediately to Parkland Memorial Hospital. We drove there, S.A. Hallett, driving in SS-361. At the Parkland Memorial Hospital, 5201 Harry Hines Boulevard, Dallas, Texas, I took up temporary post of duty at a door to a room at the emergency section after the president's death was announced and I returned to the Dallas district office and took over duties at the telephone to correlate activities of other agents. It's from Robert Stewart. Okay, here we have a statement from Richard Johnson. I wasn't sure if they were going to put this in here because this is, uh, if this is what I think it is, it's a pretty goddamn important statement. So here we go to Chief uh, James Rowley, November 30th, 63, from S.A. Johnson, White House Detail. Activities of reporting agent on November 22nd, 1963. I arrived at Dallas International Airport, USAF 6970 at 11.40 a.m. I, together with 8 Zach Stout, S.A.'s Solomon, Berger, and Olson, was met upon deplaning by S.A. Lawson. 
uh, S.A. Lawson directed us uh, to two awaiting Dallas Police Department detective cars. We were driven directly to the Dallas Trademark by two Dallas Police Department detectives. Upon our arrival at the Trademark, we were uh, met by S.A. Grant, who directed the two cars to a reserve parking spot. The detectives were instructed by S.A. Grant to remain with their cars until the conclusion of the ceremonies at the Trademark, then to drive those agents who rode with them back to the airport. Uh, we were then posted in the Trademark by S.A. Grant. As I remember, Sack Stout was seated directly in front of the podium of the speaker stand, S.A.'s Olsen and Solomon on either side of the speaker stand, and S.A. Berger in the first balcony with the uh, movie cameras. I was assigned to the ground floor press area. Upon being posted, I was informed by S.A. Grant that the president should arrive in approximately 50 minutes. Being that there were no press in the area I was assigned, uh, I walked onto the speaker stand and made an additional safety and security check. After having checked the speaker stand, I walked to where S.A. Solomon was posted. Shortly thereafter, I was informed by the press that the president had been shot. I went to the presidential entrance of the trade fair and notified S.A. Grant. He instructed me to notify the others on my shift and go directly to the hospital the president had been taken to. Eightsack Stout and the others on his shift rode to the hospital in our assigned detective cars. Upon arriving at Parkland Hospital, I positioned myself with S.A. Berger at the door leading to the leading to President Kennedy's room. At various times, I was taken from this post and positioned outside the vice president's room with S.A. Bennett. At approximately 1.30 p.m., I was outside of the president's room with S.A. Berger when Chief Nurse Nelson entered the president's room. She was followed by an unidentified man, white male, 40 to 45 years of age, 6 foot 2, 185 pounds, gray hair. When S.A. Berger and I stopped him, he said, FBI made a determined effort to enter the president's room. We stopped him and asked for his credentials. He again tried to forcibly enter the president's room and had to be restrained. After he had been subdued, he produced his FBI credentials. At this time, Asik Kellerman appeared and asked the FBI agent to go to the end of the hall. Congressman Olin Teague witnessed this incident. Uh, S.A. Berger was assured by the congressman that the FBI man had not attempted to produce any identification and appeared to be determined to enter the president's room. He stated that if there were any inquiries, that he'd be more than glad to give a statement in our service's behalf. Uh, Nurse Nelson was interviewed by S.A. Berger in my presence. She stated that the FBI agent had shown her no identification. Approximately five minutes prior to leaving the hospital with the casket and Mrs. Kennedy, I was instructed to remain at the presidential door and wait uh, to be advised that the casket was leaving uh, the hospital and then ride the follow-up car to the airport. During this period, a Mr. Wright from the security staff came to me with an expended bullet and wished to turn it over to a Secret Service agent. The only information I was able to get from him prior to the departure of Mrs. Kennedy and the casket was that the bullet had been found on a stretcher which President Kennedy may have been placed on. He also stated that he found rubber gloves, a stethoscope, and other doctor's paraphernalia on the same stretcher. On the drive from the hospital uh, to Air Force Number 1, I rode in the follow-up car. Upon our arrival at Air Force 1, I assisted in placing the casket upon USAF Number 26,000. While waiting for the departure of Air Force 1, I was instructed by 8 Sack Stout to ride in the rear of the plane. With the casket, this had been a request of President Johnson. Upon our arrival at Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, I positioned myself near the press room. After the uh, statement to the press by President Johnson, I rode helicopter number two to the White House, and that's from Richard Johnson on 116. All right, so this is a great little... Uh, I'm glad they included this in here. Uh, this is also from Richard Johnson. It says here, The attached expended bullet was received by me. Approximately five minutes prior to Mrs. Kennedy's departure from the hospital, it was found on one of the stretchers located in the emergency ward of the hospital. Also on this same stretcher was uh, rubber gloves, a stethoscope, and other doctor's paraphernalia. It could not be determined who had used this stretcher or if President Kennedy had occupied it. No further information was obtained. The name of the person who I received this bullet was from Mr. O.P. Wright, Personnel Director of Security, Dallas County Hospital District. And that's a, a supplemental report by uh, Richard uh, E. Johnson. This is a crucial report because this goes to show that it fucking had nothing to do with President Kennedy's stretcher or Connolly's stretcher. 
and that the bullet was just planted on a random stretcher in the basement of the fucking hospital. And who do we know is in the basement of the hospital? Mr. Valenti himself. <clears throat> All right, now it seems like we have statements of the highway patrolman and sucks. We're getting to the end of this document. Statement of Joe Henry Rich, Texas Highway Patrolman, made on November 28th, 1963. My name is Joe Henry Rich. Uh, employed by Texas Highway Patrol, I was assigned to drive the vice president uh, security car for November 22nd, 1963. As we came into the downtown area where the crowd was extra heavy, I was instructed by the Secret Service man to stay close to the vice president's car as possible. And so that actually only thing I was watching was the car ahead of me. I was staying right on his bumper. We turned off of Houston Street onto Elm Street. And that was when I heard the first shot. I noticed a lot of confusion up ahead of me, motorcycle policeman in the president's car and in the president's security car. Uh, this secret service man in the front seat with me made the remark, what the hell was that? And about that time, I heard two more shots. Uh, there could have been more shots, but I could not say. The cars ahead of me started up at a fast pace and the secret service man advised me to get the hell out of there. So I stayed as close as I could to the vice president's car on the way to the hospital. And as we pulled into the hospital at Parkland, the Secret Service man got in my car, got out in, in my car, got out as soon as we stopped. I stayed back with my car, but I did see them get Governor Connolly out of the car and also take the president out of the car. After that, I was more or less doing security and keeping people back, etc. That is about all I have. Actually, I did not see too much, and that's from Joe Henry Rich. Now we have a statement from uh, Herschel Jacks, Texas Highway Patrolman, made November 28, 63. My name is Herschel Jacks, Texas State Highway Patrolman. I was assigned on November 22, 1963 to drive the presidential, uh, the Vice President Lind Lyndon Johnson in the motorcade from the airport to the trademark through downtown Dallas. Just prior to turning off Maine onto Houston, I noticed it was approximately 28 minutes past 12 noon. We just turned from Maine onto Houston, drove one block, and turned left. My car had just straightened up from making uh, the left turn. I was looking directionally at the president's car at that time. At that time, I heard a shot ring out, which appeared to come from the right rear of the president's car. Mr. Rufus Youngblood, the Secret Service agent riding in my car, asked me uh, what that was. And at the same time, he advised the vice president and Mrs. Johnson to get down. He climbed to the rear of the seat with the vice president and appeared to be shielding the vice president with his own body. At this time, I heard two more shots ring out. Uh, at that time, he told me to get out of there as fast as possible. Uh, I moved my car up directly behind the Secret Service car following the president. We turned onto the Stemmons Expressway and proceeded north. Mr. Youngblood asked if I could see anybody in the president's car. I told him I could not, but that they may be down using protective measures. Uh, we drove at a high rate of speed and exited at Wycliffe exit off of Stemmons Expressway. We turned right on Industrial Boulevard. Mr. Youngblood then asked me how far it was to the trademark. I told him that we weren't going to the trademark, that we'd already passed the trademark. We turned left onto Harry Hines, and he asked if I knew where we might be going. I told him that at the time, we'd been turning left uh, into Parkland Hospital. I told him that somebody must have been hit because we were heading for the hospital. We drove to the emergency entrance of Parkland Memorial Hospital. The president's car was stopped in the ambulance parking place. At that time, I saw that the vice president, Mrs. Johnson, and Senator Yarborough was out of my car and safely in that hospital. I went back to the president's car to see if I might assist. At that time, the Secret Service agents were removing Governor Connolly from the jump seat. I could see that Governor Connolly had been hit just below the right shoulder blade in the back. They removed Governor Connolly and then picked uh, Mrs. Kennedy from over the president's body. At that time, one of the Secret Service agents said he has been hit. Put your coat over him. One of the agents removed his suit coat and spread it over the president's body from his chest up before the president's body was covered it appeared that the bullet had struck him above the right ear or near the temple uh they removed his body at that time uh, reporters began to arrive uh we were assigned by the secret service to prevent any pictures of any nature to be taken of the president's car or inside statement from herschel jacks and the last statement we have is a statement of Milton Wright, Texas Highway Patrolman, made on November 28, 1963. My name is Milton T. Wright, Texas Highway Patrolman, badge number 790. On November 22nd, I was assigned to drive a 63 Mercury Comet convertible that contained the mayor and his wife and a U.S. congressman. 
we turned onto Houston Street. The parade was going real well and sped uh, and speed was beginning to pick up uh, and the crowd was beginning to thin right at this point. The car I was driving had just turned onto Elm Street and approximately 30 feet from the intersection when I heard the first shot. When the second shot was fired, I noticed a number of people running away from the motorcade and I saw several Dallas motorcycle policemen had their guns drawn. Then the motorcade speeded up and we went toward the hospital at a high rate of speed. I could see the president's car, but I could not see anyone in the back seat. Uh, the only people I could see were the agents at the hospital were unloaded. Uh, we unloaded governor first and then the president. Uh, then we were instructed to keep the news media away from the car. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will complete Commission's Exhibit 1024, which is the um, grouping of Secret Service statements made uh, and presented to the Warren Commission. So, but are we done with this? Oh uh, fuck no! We are going. We are going to get into the statements of Jack Valente in reference to where he was during the motorcade. We are going to get into um, everything surrounding uh, Dave Powers exiting the vehicle. Uh, even though we covered that on day one, we're going to go into some more detail. We're going to cover Ken O'Donnell's statements because he's a lying fucking traitor who drank himself to death in 1977. I wonder if he felt guilty about something. Hmm? So, uh, that's going to do it for today. Uh, people, buy the book. Okay, It's on Amazon. Uh, if you want to get a signed copy, hit me up. And um, I still have signed posters available, limited edition. Um, and, yeah. So, uh, that's going to do it for today. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow with more of 8 plus 2 equals 10. Thank you. <laughs>